Well, we are continuing in Hebrews. We're in chapter 7. So take a moment now to find your place. And I'll invite you after you found that spot to stand and we will hear from God's word. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 19. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils? And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. As you can see, we're getting into the weeds, into, uh, into very, not shallow, but deep waters here. And um, just as I prayed, I pray that the Spirit will enable us not only to intellectually understand what's going on, but that it would be uh, a, a word that is applicable and relevant to us today. You guys know a song, do you guys know a band called Weezer? There's this, I'm not, I'm not, uh, it, this is the only introduction that I could come up with, I'm sorry. But uh, they have a song. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sponsoring it or anything. The only, I think the only reason this song is popular is because it's, it's very, it's, it has a cool sound to it. It's very anthemic. It's an anthem. Beverly Hills. You guys know that song? <laughs> That's. Some people are like, no. 
that's where I want to be. It's not that high. Anyway, there's this, there's this really dumb song. It goes, Beverly Hills, that's where I want to be. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple song. Uh, Beverly Hills is this very nice upscale neighborhood in, in LA. And uh, the song is about how he wants, he, this guy wants to be with the cool people. Um, but here's my segue. <laughs> that's where he wants to be. Where do you want to be? Um, and not just now, this is not a question, not just uh, for this moment, or let's say in the summer, you want to go to a, a nice vacation. My question is, where is life? Where is real living found for you? Where is that, if I could put it this way, that promised land? It's funny. Uh, Beverly Hills, which is in L.A., which is in California, California for many people, even though we have a transplant from California, several trans transplants, transplants from California here, California for many East Coasters is the promised land, to which I say, in any case, where is the promised land for you? Where, in your mind's eye, is the place you want to go where that is living. Take a moment to think about that. Well, I'm sure that all of us, we all have perhaps not the same, but different ideas of where that might be. Uh, a life of, um, a life that is like the promised land, a life that we would dream of. But the whole Bible, from beginning to end, proclaims a story in which life, real living, real life, is found in the presence of God. For example, Psalm 23. You guys know Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. At the end of that psalm, that psalm is not merely about the God being our shepherd and him providing for our every needs, but also this is how the psalm ends. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and... Here's the kicker. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, what he's saying, he's not saying that I'm going to dwell in the temple or in a church. He's saying, I'm going to be with God forever. That is the dream. A few psalms after that, Psalm 27. This is the psalmist prayer. One thing have I asked of the Lord that, I, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Once again, his prayer is not that he will live at church all day long or at the temple. His prayer is that he will be with God. Not just after life. This is usually how we think of eternal life. Eternal life, that's for after this life. Sure, sure, uh, we can live with God forever, but now... Now is the time I can really enjoy it. Well, no, for the psalmist, he prays to God that I will dwell in the house of the Lord, meaning be with him all the days of my life. Yes, in eternity, but even now. All the days of this life that we have. That's his prayer. And that's how it was, actually. When God created Adam and Eve, he, he placed them in Eden in the Garden of Eden. And the Garden was not a place merely for human beings to live in, but it was also a place in which God was because he, God would fellowship with them. God would walk with them. They would regularly be together in fellowship, in communion. But we know, of course, what happened after that, the fall, sin, and that's why they were kicked out of the Garden. 
All right. The, the worst thing about being kicked out of the garden was not that now they didn't have access to all the, the wonderful fruit trees or, or anything like that. The worst thing is that they were kicked out of God's presence. They were kicked out of dwelling with the Lord. And then we, if you fast forward all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, this is the promise that is held out to us. Behold, the dwelling place of God is not far away, but it is with man. He, God, will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. God will be in the midst of his people. Face to face we shall see him. We will enjoy him we will have fellowship with him the bible teaches us that life real life eternal life is being with him now this this message this yeah this message let me start off with a disclaimer here. This message will be helpful for you if that is something that you seek. That is, you really desire to dwell with God. You really want to be with Him. But if that is not something that you desire, if that is actually, you know, whatever, then all this talk about Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood and the, uh, and the so on and so forth, well, it's just noise. It's just encyclopedia. It's Wikipedia to you. So that is a warning. Uh, that, what, that it'll only be helpful to you. This passage and this message will only be helpful to you if this is what you seek. That like the psalmist this would be a prayer of yours that you will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life. And so now uh, we continue here. Uh, there is a problem, there is a big problem for why we cannot dwell in God's presence. Even though that is life, that is eternal life, as we've already established, it happened back in, back in Eden with Adam and Eve's uh, sin, in their disobedience, the problem, of course, is sin. Our sin is a great, creates a great big chasm between us and God so that it's not some casual thing for us now to dwell with Him. And what is sin exactly? Uh, this is something that we go over in our membership class, in our membership or baptism class. Sin is not merely uh, brokenness. Sin is not merely, uh, you know, a mistake that, that you commit. Um, it is not merely sort, some sort of ignorance where you, maybe you didn't know the right thing. Sin is wickedness. It is iniquity. Transgression. Transgression means there is a boundary and you have transgressed it. You have gone beyond where you should not have gone. Sin is law-breaking. Right? All these terms impress upon us the fact that sin is, it's, it's, it's not just something that happens to you. We consciously do the bad thing. We, we go against what we know to be right. We go against God's commands. Furthermore, it's not just the commands that we break. Sin is personal. It's not just the commands. Those commands come from God. Those are his words. So sin, therefore, is personal. It is rebellion against God. One way that the Bible describes sin is that it is spiritual adultery. Right? Adultery, I hope you're aware, is heinous. It's a very bad sin. It is to be unfaithful to your spouse, to your wife, or to your husband. And we all do it to God. We are called to be faithful to him, and yet we are unfaithful. We turn to our idols, we turn away from God, and we give our love 
to creatures. We give our love to made-up things. We give our love to things that are not God, things that obviously don't deserve our, our love, but also won't, don't provide any satisfaction. Maybe temporary little satisfaction, but ultimately they'll deliver death and destruction to us. Sin is the corruption in our hearts, the uncleanness in our hearts. It's perversion. As you can see, I, I hope I've, in these short amount of words, impressed upon you the fact that sin is no small trifle. There is a reason why there is a great gulf between us and God. Because of this reality, the priesthood, that's where the priesthood comes in. Priests are God's chosen instruments to mediate between the holy God, the God who is holy, 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 and the, there are angels in his presence who have to shield their eyes and their bodies and their legs from his glory and his radiance. This is how holy and radiant and awesome he is. And yet God has provided a means for us sinful humans to draw a little closer. And he uses, God uses priests for us to do that. Now it's important for us to understand that priests are not, or they don't act on their own. Um, priests are not free agents, meaning they don't do whatever they please. If you've ever read through the book of Judges, you'll read about these random free agent priests who, um, so for example, in the book of Judges, there's a scene in which some guy hires a Levite to be his personal priest. And um, that's not a thing. You can't hire a personal priest so that you can have this connection with God. Uh, priests don't, ought not do their own things, and the book of Judges shows the deadly consequences of when you just make up your own religion. Priests, in the nature of the case, have to be established by God. I anoint, I appoint you as a priest to mediate between these sinful people and me. That's the only way it can be. And that system, by the way, is, is found in the Old Testament. If you've read through the Old Testament, it's a, you'll see the priesthood is established first at Mount Sinai. Remember, at Mount Sinai, they receive the Ten Commandments, but also they stay there for a while, and they also receive the entire system, system which God establishes so that people, the people of God, can draw near to him. And that's why our passage mentions the Levitical priesthood. The reason the, priest, the priesthood is called Levitical is because they all came from the tribe of Levi, that's why also the third book in the Old Testament is called Leviticus. The word Levi is in all of them. And so that's why in verses 5 and 9 of our passage, the descendants of Levi are mentioned, or Levi himself. But also, here's a smaller, here, here's another detail. Uh, the priests specifically came from an even smaller family than the entire tribe of Levi. Priests themselves must be descendants of Aaron. Aaron, by the way, was a descendant of Levi. And so that's why our passage refers to the order of Aaron. So there's a tribe called Levi, and then there's a smaller family within that tribe in which Aaron is the, is the father, and all of his sons, uh, if they meet certain requirements, become priests. And that's why it's called the Order of Aaron. God establishes this system, this Aaronic or Levitical priesthood as a way for him, the living God, to dwell in the midst of a sinful people. Again, the whole entire system, meaning the sacrifices, the priests, the tabernacle, the altar, everything God gives specific instructions. He establishes this is how it's going to be in order that the people might be able to draw near to him. 
Because, once again, that's life. That is true life. Now, in our passage, the author of Hebrews makes a very surprising point about this entire system that he had established back in the Old Testament, which is found in verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, and I'll just stop right there. His point is that perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. And he makes that same point again down in verse 19. The law made nothing perfect. And by the way, this is not a point that only the author of Hebrews makes. Paul makes the same exact point in Romans and in Galatians. And this point is this, that the Old Testament system of religion that God himself established, the sacrifices, the priests, the tabernacle, the altar, everything... It didn't actually qualify sinners to enjoy unhindered access to the Holy God. The, this entire religious apparatus didn't and couldn't impart to us fallen human beings a firm confidence to draw near to our God who is described in other parts of the Bible, also in chapter 12 of Hebrews, he is this, God is described as a consuming fire. That, that's a description of his holiness, of, of how, of how uh, we ought to fear him in a certain way. He is a consuming fire. And actually, the whole entire Old Testament apparatus with the sacrifices and the priests and all that, it didn't actually impart to us this firm confidence that we could actually draw near to him. Let me tell you a story from Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, Aaron and his sons are ordained as priests. Well, that was back in chapter 9. And so after the end, at the end of chapter 9, um, the people are worshiping God because the glory of the Lord visibly appears. And they're like, wow, God is with us. And then a fire comes down from heaven and burns up the entire sacrifice, meaning God accepts the sacrifice. People are in awe. People are worshiping God. And in the next chapter, chapter 10, two sons of Aaron, who are priests now, Nadab and Abihu, perhaps they get caught up in the excitement but they decide to get a little creative in their worship. And so the passage in Leviticus 10 says, they offered to the Lord unauthorized fire. Uh, we don't know what that means. It's just a general description. It's unauthorized, meaning God didn't say do this. They just decided to do it on their own. And so what happens as a result of their decision to offer un unauthorized fire before the Lord? Well, moments before, remember, fire came down out of heaven and, dis and consumed their sacrifices. But now, fire comes down out of heaven and destroys Nadab and Abihu. And this, was, this was moments after they just became priests. But they got a little too creative, and God's like, no, you're done. When you think about it, when you consider the entire Old Testament system, it actually doesn't perfect sinners. The Old Testament system does not actually raise sinners up to glory. It doesn't raise us up to completion. It doesn't bring us right into the presence of God with security and confidence. Instead, the Old Testament system teaches and warns sinners. It teaches sinners that God is a holy, he's, he's holy. He's not to be trifled with. God is a fire. He's a consuming fire. It teaches us that a sacrifice is required. Blood must be shed if we, are gonna, if we have any hope of drawing near to him. It warns against sinners from presuming that we can just walk, walk right up to God. Hey, God, pal, buddy. It warns us from presuming that we can get in 
based on our own merits, based on our own righteousness, our, our, our own goodness, or our, our own good intentions, or perhaps that we've, uh, we're our church, that means that we can get in. No, the Old Testament system teaches sinners simply this, that we are sinners and that God is holy. But what it doesn't do is, is actually bridge the gap. It doesn't actually perfect us in such a way that we can confidently and boldly draw near. That's why Hebrew says in verse 18, the former commandment, referring once again to the Old Testament system, the sacrifices, the priests, the tabernacle, the altar, that former commandment is weak and useless. Because the, Levit the Levitical priests didn't perfect sinners. That wasn't, it couldn't do that. It was powerless to qualify sinners from drawing near to God, to be with him and to dwell with him. Now this passage, this teaching about the order of Melchizedek, by the way, back in chapter 5, the author of Hebrew says he was about to teach on it, but then he went on a tangent, but he said this is really hard to teach. Not because it's difficult material, but because you've become dull of hearing. So let us pray that we don't have dull hearts. This passage is simply saying this. Jesus, it's, it's the title of this message. Jesus is a different, better kind of priest. That's what this, that's what this passage is saying to us. Now, if you are wondering why the author of Hebrews goes into such detail on this unknown character, unknown to many of us, I'm sure, character in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, it's because Psalm 110, which is, one of the, which is the most quoted psalm in the entire New Testament. You guys know in the New Testament, people are always quoting from the Old Testament. Psalm 110 is the most quoted chapter of the Old Testament in the New Testament. It's a very important psalm. And in Psalm 110, this is what it says about the Messiah and the Savior of God's people. You are a priest forever, meaning about Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek. So, we, so it behooves us to understand what Psalm 110 is saying. Since... It makes this proclamation that the coming Messiah would be a priest, not a Levitical priest, but a Melchizedekian priest. So the, so the question arises naturally, who is Melchizedek? Well, until he is mentioned in Psalm 110 and discussed here in, in the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek appears for a total of four verses in, in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14, he appears for a total of four verses. He's the kind of character who, who if you blink as you read through the Bible, you're going to miss. In fact, even in the chapter that he appears in, he's sort of, an, he's sort of a minor character. He, the action doesn't really center around him. He's kind of an afterthought in the story. So let me summarize for you what happens in chapter 4 of Genesis. There's a war. On one side, there are four cities, and the other side, there are five cities. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, probably around the year 2000 BC, somewhere around there. So it's, it's a long time ago, 4,000 years ago or so, or, or so. There's a war, four cities against five cities. And the only reason this war, by the way, throughout human history, there have been perhaps millions of wars. So why is this one war recorded in sacred history? Well, the only reason we have it recorded in the Bible is because Lot, who happens to be Abraham's nephew, is captured because he happens to live on the wrong side. He, he lives with the five cities who happen to be the losers in this war, so he gets taken captive. Him and his household and all his possessions are taken prisoner. And so if, if his uncle was anyone else, well, that'd be the end of the story. Uh, that's tough luck. 
But his uncle, his uncle happens to be Abraham. So Abraham, he rounds up the troops. He gets some of his friends and his, and his servants together, a small army, to get, go get his nephew back. He does do that. But not only that, he defeats the four, the, the four kings in battle. Not only does he get his nephew back, he defeats these other kings, which is why our passage says that Abraham returned from the slaughter of the kings. And so this is where Melchizedek appears for a brief moment. In Genesis 14, he's barely given even an introduction. All we know are his name, his position, he's the king of Salem, and most significantly, he is identified as priest of the Most High God. And as priest, what does Melchizedek do? He pronounces a blessing on Abraham. He says, blessed be Abraham so on and so forth. And so Abraham recognizes that this is a legitimate priest, and the way we know that is because Abraham gives him a tithe. He, this is what you're supposed to do. In the Old Testament system, you gave a tithe to the Aaronic priests, to the Levitical priests, and Abraham, even before that entire system is set up, he receives a blessing and Aaron gives him a tithe. He gives him a tenth part of, of the spoils of war. And that's the end of the story. That's it. Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a priest who basically comes out of nowhere in the story of Abraham, and he doesn't appear again until he's mentioned in Psalm 110. For a brief moment, Melchizedek serves as the God-ordained means through whom Abraham worships God and Abraham receives a blessing from God and enjoys communion with God. By the way, you guys know that we call the Lord's Supper, sometimes we call it Holy Communion. Communion is a word that just means deep fellowship. And we know that Abraham enjoyed communion with God through Melchizedek because in that scene, by the way, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. It says, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. So they didn't have communion in the sense that we have it, but he enjoyed fellowship with God through Melchizedek. Now, what is so significant about Melchizedek? Verse 3 says this, of he, he, verse 3 of Hebrews 7, he is without father or mother or genealogy. What does that mean? The author of Hebrews is not saying that Melchizedek, Melchizedek actually had no parents or genealogy as if he is some sort of God. Rather, what he's highlighting is the fact that none of those details are mentioned in Genesis 14. And that's worth highlighting because when it comes to Levitical priests, those details are very important. In fact, that is the main criteria for becoming a Levitical priest. Who is your mother? Who is your father? What is your genealogy? But here, when Melchizedek is mentioned, excuse me, when he, when he shows up in the scene, there is no mention of his genealogy. And that's because for Melchizedek, his ancestry is not what qualifies him to be priest. Then the author of our passage appears to make a jump here, quite a jump. He says that Melchizedek has neither beginning of days nor end of life. And because of that, he continues a priest forever. Now again, the author of Hebrews is not saying that Melchizedek was a god. And that's why he's, he's, uh, he's still living now somewhere. That's not what he's saying. Rather, what he's pointing out is that Melchizedek, he just kind of pops up in the narrative out of nowhere. And in that way, in that singular way, that's how Melchizedek resembles the Son of God. To put it another way, long before the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would come and be our great high priest, God appointed Melchizedek to resemble the greater priest to come. 
How so? How does Melchizedek re resemble our great high priest? Well, one, not only does he not have a priestly genealogy, right? His, there is no record of his, of his uh, family background, but also his tenure as priest is not marked by a beginning or an end. That means for the author of Hebrews that as far as he's concerned, the priesthood of Melchizedek has no end. That's why he says that he continues a priest forever. And that's different from the Levitical priesthood because the Levitical priesthood by definition is handed down through the generations. When you say you hand something down through the generations, do you know what's being implied here? That means that, some, that the, the older generation is gonna die and the newer generation has to take it up. And then that generation is going to die. And then the new generation has to take it up. That's what's being implied when you say hand it down through the generations. Well, in the Melchizedek's case, there is no handing down. So for our intents and purposes, that means he has an unending priesthood. But secondly, Melchizedek is not some minor figure that we can ignore. Follow with me in verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Don't be fooled by how little screen time Melchizedek gets in the Bible. Because, notice this, this man, verse 6, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Even though Abraham at this point had already received blessing from God, he had already received promises from God, Melchizedek comes along and blesses him even further. Verse 7, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. That is, it is the person of higher rank who blesses the person of lower rank. Isaac, you guys know the book of Genesis? Isaac blesses Jacob, his son. Jacob blesses his sons, right? The, the, the blessings roll down. They don't roll up. God blesses us. The blessings roll down, not vice versa. I bless my children. They don't bless me. You see how it goes? And, and, and in the same way, this shows that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and certainly greater than Levi who came after Abraham. So who is Melchizedek? Here it is. Simply, he is someone who is greater than Abraham who anticipates a greater priest to come. And now this leads us to the order of Melchizedek, which means simply a different, better kind of priesthood. If Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, was so great, and if the Levitical priesthood was so lacking, so ineffective, so weak, so useless, it stands to reason why God would appoint his final priest not to be a Levitical priest, but after the order of Melchizedek. And that's why David's prophecy of Jesus in Psalm 110 says what it says. You are a priest forever, saying of Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek. That means that Jesus is not a Levitical priest. And that's clear, first of all, because he's not even from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of, excuse me, he's not even from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. So what qualifies Jesus to be priest? Not his lineage, not his physical or outward characteristics, much in the same way like Melchizedek. And like Melchizedek, Jesus has a far greater qualification to be priest. Verse 16 says that he has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. That means that Jesus' priesthood is based not on whether or not he has the right family pedigree. Did, did he come from the right tribe or family? That's not what it's based on. 
but on the fact that he has been raised from the dead, never to die again. Let, let me offer up an, a very imprecise illustration. Uh, don't think about it too hard. Let me ask you, which is better? A basketball player with the right family background? Like Bronny James, he comes from the right family background. Or, or here's another person from the, uh, Michael Jordan had two sons. He comes from the right family background. Would you rather have that basketball, basketball player? Or would you rather have a player with the power of LeBron or the power of Michael Jordan? Now, for those of you who are familiar with these players, you know that the right family pedigree doesn't actually give you what you need. You need the powers. You want the powers, not just the right family background. And how much more when it comes to a priest who would enable us to draw near to the living God with confidence, to dwell with him forever? Do you want a priest whose main qualification is he was born to the right family. He checks all the physical and outward characteristics. Or do you want a priest who has conquered death, who has ascended to the right hand of the Father, who ministers in heaven as an eternal priest? Which one do you want? The answer is obvious, right? This is simply, this is all that it means. When it says that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Simply, once again, that he is a different, better kind of priest. Now, when we say that he is a better kind of priest, we're not just mentioning the fact that he was raised again from the dead, as important as that is. We're also making another point. What the Levitical priests could not do, what the Old Testament system, with all its sacrifices and priests and, temp and tabernacle and altar, could not do. What, what could it not do? It could not make sinners perfect. It could not qualify sinners to boldly draw near to God, to be with him and to dwell with him forever. What those things could not do, Jesus can do, he does, and he will do for anyone who puts their hope in him. That's what it means when we say that Jesus is a better kind of priest. That's why at the end of our passage, it says that we have a better hope through whom we draw near to God. Now, I think there's a difference, not I think, there is a difference between us and the Hebrew Christians who were the people that uh, the author was writing to at first, right? Because for the Hebrew Christians, for them, they were familiar with the Levitical system. For many of them, that was what they, they were used to growing up. They, when they were children, perhaps, or in, in, their, young, in their youth, they were used to draw, having to draw near to God through, this, through the sacrifices, through priests. And so that it was hard for them to make that transition. But for us, we don't need to receive this particular encouragement because we've never used the Old Testament system. None of us have uh, come used a Levitical priest in order to offer up a sacrifice to God. In fact, no Jew even, living Jew right now, has done that because that system has been done away. The temple has been destroyed 2,000 years ago. And yet, we often do try to draw near to the Holy God, not through our great high priest who perfects sinners, who qualifies sinners so that we might draw near, but often we try to draw near to God through some other means, through some other quote unquote religious means. I have a question for you. What what lesser hope, not what better hope, but what lesser hope do you depend on in order to draw near to God? 
I would guess that for many of us, we depend on the fact that we come from a Christian family. We come from a Christian family, and that's what qualifies me to draw near to God. Or for others of us, perhaps it's simply mere church attendance. And that mere is very important. I'm not saying that church attendance is something that we should poo-poo, not at all. But mere church attendance is church attendance solely for the purpose of checking that checkbox off. Yes, I went to church. Is that what qualifies you to draw near to God? Or perhaps it's that you have done your devotions. You've been doing your devotions recently, and that's what qualifies you to draw near to God. You've read your Bible. You said your prayers. God must be pleased. Or is it that you're part of the right kind of church? Not, you're not part of a bad church. You're part of a good church, relatively good church. That's what qualifies you to draw near to God. Is your confidence in the fact that you have correct theology, not wrong theology? You believe the right thing, not the wrong thing. And therefore God is pleased and he will receive you into his presence. Or is it your years, many years, many decades of past faithfulness? You've served the church for a long time and that's what qualifies you to draw near to God. Or, to piggyback off of what I said about mere church attendance, is it the mere reception of the sacraments, simply that you've received these physical elements? That's good enough for me to draw near to God. None of these things, and perhaps it might be something else for you, none of these things can perfect sinners. None of these things can qualify us, purify us, cleanse us, so that we can draw near to God Most Holy with confidence and boldness. This is why Jesus is a better priest. He does what none of these other things or people can do, which is he actually does bring us near to God, not only in the life to come, yes, but in this life now. You know, at the beginning of the sermon, I said, if you truly desire, if you truly want to be with God forever, to dwell with him forever, you're going to receive the encouragement that you need, because we have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who does just that, he, if you put your hope in him, one plus one equals two, you are going to be, you have assurance, you have confidence that through him, you will draw near to God in this life and in the life to come forever. However, if this is, if this is not actually what you want, if that's just a uh, take it or leave it kind of thing, then this teaching about Jesus being our great high priest, he's, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, that's, again, this teaching will do nothing for you. Because you're not actually looking for more than a type of, like a ceremonial type of relationship with God. You're, you're not looking for anything deeper than a merely external kind of relationship with God. A sort of a one hour on a Sunday kind of relationship with God. And if that's what you want, then you don't actually need a priest after the order of Melchizedek. A Levitical priest is just fine for you because it would just be merely external. It would be ritualistic. It would just be momentary. But if you're fine with that, then you will not receive the ministry of the one who died and was raised again. You will not receive the ministry of the one who is ascended into heaven, who sits at God's right hand. 
you will not receive the ministry of the one who shall return again to judge the world in truth and righteousness. If this is you, if you have, if you find in your heart that it's, you, find, you don't actually want to be near to God, to dwell with him and to be with him, I invite you. I invite you to pray to God that he would change your desires. Yes, our desires can change. As we submit ourselves in humility to God, pray, ask him that he would change your desires so that you will want to draw near to him. Not merely in this outward religion fashion, but truly and forever. That's my exhortation to you. Let us pray. Lord God, it is, I admit, a difficult teaching uh, to understand, to grasp, but also to appropriate in our lives that, that, Lord Jesus, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But we hold on to this, that now through you we have a better hope. That despite the great chasm between you and us, this, this seemingly uncrossable void because of our sin and transgression and uncleanness, you are a better kind of priest. And because of you, Lord, we can draw near to you, to God forever, even now today. So I pray, Lord, that you would enable us to put our hope in you. In whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand.